In 2008, I was in the Navy. We were over 100 miles from any land, and it was about 3 to 4 in the morning off the coast of Peru. I was an electronics technician, so I worked in radio with one other guy, a radio man, and we just sat up scanning the HF, UHF, and VHF radios listening for drug runners. We intercepted a UHF signal that played a short piano preamble, followed by a haunting, computerized-sounding woman's voice reading numbers. 11, 9, 4, 6. This went on for about a minute. Then the preamble repeated, followed by the same number sequence. Then it was gone. We recorded the transmission, wrote the numbers down, informed the captain, and shortly a message was sent off to the area commander about the strange message. The reply we received was, disregard, creeped me out. I came to find out that this is a number station, and while the phenomenon is not entirely understood, it's likely a method for getting a secure message or code to an intelligence agent in the field over an insecure method of communication. Since the numbers could be attached to a one-time code, it's basically indecipherable. Either way, it was super creepy. My wife, sister, and I are all avid backpackers. We spend a lot of time in the outdoors. But back in 2018, we decided to do pull-up camping with stargazing in Colorado as the main goal. We're from the Midwest. We used a light pollution map to find a remote camping area in San Juan National Forest and planned to hike during the day and stargaze at night. The first day and night, the stars and trails were amazing, and we were all super stoked to be in the mountains and away from Flatland. It was the clearest I've ever seen the Milky Way galaxy, and it was phenomenal. After the first night, we all got up early and decided to do another hike, this time following a small dirt forest road through the mountains. We were all having a great time, and there were nothing but positive vibes. I mentioned that our hike felt more like a walk since we were on a road, so we all agreed to take the first proper trail we came across. We had a GPS unit, a map, and a compass, so we weren't worried about getting lost. We finally came across a trail that ran perpendicular to the road and had a slight gradient running down the mountain. Staying true to our word, we all agreed to see where it went and turned onto the trail. As soon as we left the road and stepped onto the trail, I had an unprovoked and overwhelming feeling of doom come over me. Suddenly, my excitement left me and I felt, almost instinctually, that I would be in serious danger if I went down this trail. This unprovoked feeling of doom was strange enough, but when my sister said, Guys, I don't think we should go down this trail, and my wife responded, Oh good, you feel that too? I lost my shit. We quickly returned to the road and continued our walk. We all agreed that we had the same unprovoked sensation once we stepped onto the trail and could not come up with any logical explanation. I have never experienced anything like this and it still gives me goosebumps just thinking about it. So, I'm an avid caver from West Virginia, and there's this cave not far from me that's been one of my favorites to explore. It's often my go-to cave to take friends and newcomers to to get them into caving, as it's rather easily accessible and not too challenging of a cave. Although, it is a rather large cave system. The first thing to note is that there's never any wildlife seen in or near the cave, and I've only ever seen a few bats for as large of a cave as it is. Anyway, the first really strange thing to happen 
was that my friends and I stumbled upon a pentagram made out of salt with a dead bird in the middle, circled by what seemed to be freshly burnt out candles. Obviously it was freaky, but we took it to be a prank by some teens or something along those lines. I've always been very comfortable going through this cave and leading treks, but up until now I had always been with a group of friends. One day, I decided to take my girlfriend through, so just the two of us went. We didn't make it past the first chamber, because I just had such an uneasy feeling. It was as if I just needed to get out of there. My way of describing it is the feeling of being watched, but on steroids. I've been in some sketchy places, but I've never had that sense of dread in all my life. The next thing to happen is that a group of us went back in and stumbled upon a newer looking jacket far back into the cave that was never there before. I wouldn't have taken it to be so odd, but it seemed to be a rather expensive jacket with no apparent damage or reason to just leave it laying behind randomly far back in this portion of the cave. There was also nobody else around at this time. The next thing to happen was when a group of us friends were exploring, and on the way back out, one of my most serious friends just seemed really strange and off. Finally, I asked him if he was good, and he nodded and quickly told me to just keep moving. Once we got out of the cave, he pulled me aside privately, which is really not like him, but he told me that he didn't think it was a good idea to go back in there. I finally convinced him to tell me why, and he told me that he swore he saw a person back there. From what he could see, a very pale, lanky person. He couldn't quite make it out at first, but he said that he noticed it following us. He even tried calling out a few times, but we didn't think anything of him doing that at the time, because it's fun to yell and make echoes. Anyway, after this experience, I convinced the same friend to go back with me, along with our other buddy, to reach an extremely difficult place that I haven't been able to access yet, seeing as I've just been taking newbies. As we arrived at the cave, there was a man and woman camping nearby who were standing at the entrance. We made a friendly conversation and asked if they were going inside. They said no, they were just checking it out. So we continued on. After reaching our goal and being at the dead end of a very tight spot, we laid and rested for a while. Then, we heard people. We all heard it at the same time, as we looked at each other and squinted. We couldn't quite make out what they were saying, as it was very distant and echoed and muffled, but we could clearly make out that it was English, male and female voices, and we heard laughter and water splashing. We thought it was pretty odd because it was in the morning and we didn't expect anyone else around but those two campers, so we figured it was them. Anyway, as we were exhausted, we rested for a good while longer and shut off our lights to save battery. We remained quiet as we were just resting and after a while, we couldn't hear them anymore. Then we went ahead and made our way back out of the cave. As we exited, the man and woman were still there by the entrance. My friend asked, so you decided to go in after all? The man replied, no, why? And we asked if anyone else had gone in or out and they said they hadn't seen anybody the entire time. At this point, we were creeped out as we all clearly heard voices but we didn't really talk about it much amongst each other. Much later, while doing research, I started putting things together in my head and realized that my friend's description was very Wendigo-esque. And then I recalled how they're very often known for being able to imitate human voices to lure prey. And it just really creeped me out. I almost wouldn't believe what he said he saw, but if you understood the person that I was talking about, if you knew him, he's not someone to ever make up something like that. Anyway, I hope you found the story interesting. 
I still don't know what we encountered. But if you have any ideas, let me know. I was big into off-trail hiking. I would usually track animals and find really cool spots to hang out, meditate, and smoke a bowl. I had a good friend that was into doing the same thing, and one weekend we decided to go hiking together, find some killer views, smoke a bowl, and talk about life. Well, we got lost. The road we wanted to take was closed, and we decided to follow the detour and see where it would take us. I should mention that we were in the middle of nowhere. The mountains are beautiful and are filled with hidden streams and waterfalls, but they are almost inaccessible due to the terrain. I have been out to the area many times and never encountered a single soul. Anyhow, back to the detour. The road should have connected with another arterial, but soon, we found ourselves on a logging road that dead-ended in the middle of the middle of nowhere. We thought this was weird, but we were like, okay, cool, an adventure. We see what looks like an old logging trail and decide to take an animal trail to the south of it. We gather up our bags and let out my German Shepherd, a rescue dog and the best darn dog that I ever had. This is important, because to get everything we needed, we had to walk around my truck. We head out about 30 minutes into the trail, and we start to feel like we're being watched. It was a bad feeling, like the kind of bad that makes your stomach drop and instinct take over. Relevant side note, I left home when I was 16 and was homeless for a while. There is nothing like a situation like that to teach you how to have eyes in the back of your head. Back to the story. The forest is silent. Not a bird moving in a tree, not a squirrel. Literally, there is no noise. It is supernaturally calm. And then, we hear a stick break about 30 feet behind us on the trail. We assume that it's a cougar as they frequent these mountains, and so we kept pressing on, but the feeling doesn't pass. I motion for my friend to keep talking as I slide off into the brush and double back. I have my dog with me, a hunting knife, and some bear spray. I'm still wanting to believe that it's a cougar, so I figure that I'll be okay. As I get close to a turn in the trail, I hear some crashing in the bushes. Odd, because the forest is still silent. But again, it could be a bear, a cougar, something like that. My dog goes running toward the sound and then stops and begins growling. I figure the gig is up and I step back out onto the trail. And that is when I notice a third set of footprints, new, large, and male. I pretend that my dog is lost and then head on back down the trail to catch up with my friend. I mouth to her that I saw another set of footprints and at that time, we decide to climb higher up onto the mountain so that we can see if anyone is approaching from below. I'm pretty sure that this decision saved our lives. As we're hiking back to the car, we discover several hunting blinds. This is off-season hunting, and it's illegal, and most of the animals people really want to poach are still higher up in the mountains, but there was still warm food sitting on a plate. It was eerie as hell. We flat out booked it off the mountain so fast, with my dog running off and growling at the person that we now know was following us. We unlock my truck as soon as we see it and grab my dog in as we're pulling away. And that's when we notice the flat tire. Someone had sliced my tire to shreds. This is when I said screw it 
and gave thanks for having a sturdy truck that I didn't care about. I didn't care if I ruined the car, the axle, or the wheel. I just wanted out of there. When we got down to the highway, a term I use loosely, I pull over and patch the tire and pump it full of air as fast as I can. I know that we saw something we shouldn't have seen. We made it to a gas station, just barely. Also very creepy, complete with the old man and dusty cans of beans. Change the tire and then drive as fast as we can back into cell range where we call the cops. I don't think that they believed us. I'm pretty sure they thought it was an animal, but people go missing in the woods all the time around here, especially in that area. Unfortunately, I didn't know this until I got home and did some research. That was the end of my off-trail hikes. I now only go on heavily populated trails with a group of people, and I always leave the name of the hike and a map along with my expected return time with my best friend. It isn't nearly as enjoyable, but it sure is a heck of a lot safer. Moral of the story? Trust your instincts. Tell someone where you're going and when you'll be back. Carry bear spray and your survival pack. Always have an emergency repair kit in your car, a battery charger, air pump for your tire, a patching kit, flares, and a couple of flashlights. No matter how safe and reliable you think the location you're going to is. I forgot to mention earlier, we saw the same footprints leading from the shelter down to the animal trail we had been on. There is no doubt in my mind that we were being stalked, if not hunted. From May of 2010 to May of 2011, I worked as a security guard at a hydroelectric dam in Virginia. It was a fairly isolated location. If you needed an ambulance, you could expect at least a 20 minute wait. About a month after I was hired, one of the guys at the dam told me that most security guards out there quit after a few days because they got so creeped out being alone at the dam at night, and that he was glad I was sticking it out. In truth, it could be creepy. Sometimes at night, when I was patrolling the basement level of the dam itself, I would think about the fact that I was 50 feet below the water line on the low side, the only human being in about a mile and a half radius. Sometimes I'd hear weird noises in the woods or catch a flash of a shadow while I was inside the dam it takes a lot to scare me though, and I knew I was either hearing critters in the woods or my mind was playing tricks on me. One night, however, something happened that scared the living hell out of me. It was a little after 11 p.m. and I was sitting in the guardhouse reading a book. Suddenly, I heard a tap at the door. What was creepy about the guardhouse at night was that when you had the lamp inside turned on, People could look through the windows at you, but the glare made it difficult for you to see outside. When I heard the tap at the door, I thought it was a bug hitting the glass. It was so faint, and I knew there weren't any contractors at the dam. I had the place to myself. Then the tap came again, more insistent this time. I grabbed my flashlight and opened the door. There was no one there. Then I let the door slip from my hand and shut behind me. To my left, previously concealed by the door as I had opened it, was a huge man, at least 400 pounds, wearing a gray sweatshirt and gray sweatpants. The sweatshirt was smeared with fresh blood. My heart started hammering. My blood ran cold. I was so scared I couldn't speak. As it turns out, he was a local fisherman who had been fishing off the bridge over the trail race. And he was wondering why the power company hadn't started back pumping into the lake yet, because they usually started a little before 11, and that was what always drew in the big striped bass. He was smeared with blood, 
because he'd already caught and gutted a couple and wiped his hands on his shirt. He felt really bad when he realized that he had approached me basically in the same way that a murderer in a horror movie would have. I am thankful to this day that I was unarmed security, because if I'd had a gun, I would have either shot him or accidentally shot myself while trying to shoot him. Either way, paranormal or not, that was the scariest night of my life working that job. About three years ago, I was on a family vacation to Eastern Washington, and a central aspect of our trip was visiting Lake Paragon State Park. It's in an extremely rural area, with a tiny western town about a mile away, and that's it for miles. We had just arrived for our 10-day stay in the afternoon, and it was now around 11 p.m. My mom and I left our hotel to go down to the park, as she was really into photography, and the moon was full. If you're not familiar, eastern Washington as a whole is very desolate, and so the night sky is generally incredible, no light pollution. There were no clouds to be seen, and we were a ways down a dirt back road, over the park, above the campground with no real roads anywhere in sight. We got out of the car and took some pictures, with nothing more unusual than the eerie silence. About 15 minutes into our visit, we were both facing away from the moon, looking at the rolling hills, and we noticed an odd concentration of light on one hillside, about a quarter mile away. Before either one of us could point it out to the other, the mass of light shining on this hill rolled away into nowhere. It took two seconds and was entirely gone. The whole hillside was brightly lit up, and then, nothing. We freaked out and got out of there as fast as humanly possible. We both saw it. There were no other people, no moving clouds, and no roads from which headlights could shine. I still have no idea what we saw. This was back when I was living with my mom, aunt, and brother. We lived in a townhouse. It was like a large house with a smaller house inside of it. My aunt owned the house, so she was alone in the larger house, which was two floors. And my mom and I lived in the smaller house. We shared the bedroom, and my brother lived in the basement. One night, my mom was in the living room watching TV. I couldn't tell you what show, but she really only watches old sitcoms, so it's a dead giveaway that this couldn't have been the TV. My brother worked as a landscaper, so by this hour he was almost always fast asleep. Our bedroom has an outside-facing wall, facing the very large fenced-in backyard, and behind it a small stretch of woodland bordered by a reservoir. There isn't any room for anything larger than a coyote to live there, and nothing larger is native to the area, considering that we live in the suburbs. There are mountain lions a little over an hour north, but wolves and other predators are not native at all. Around 1 a.m., I heard this blood-curdling scream. Before you say anything, yes, I am aware of mountain lion screams, and I've listened to them extensively, but this was absolutely not a mountain lion. It wasn't a fox, either or any other animal that I could think of that we have here, but I'm open to suggestions if you think you know any. It goes on for a good 10 or so minutes while I lay paralyzed with fear. It sounds almost like children screaming, except deeper and more terrified. It genuinely sounded like someone being killed. The next morning, I asked my mom about it and she said she didn't hear anything. My brother said that he did, but he thought that I was just up watching TV, or that maybe my aunt was fighting with her boyfriend. 
My aunt thought it was my mom having a temper tantrum. To this day, I don't know what it was, and though I don't live there anymore, it still makes me very afraid. My boyfriend and I went up to his parents' cabin a few years ago. We were the only ones up there for the weekend. We went on a short hike up along a creek known as the Strawberry Trail. We were about a half a mile up just enjoying the beautiful scenery. We embraced in a hug and we both closed our eyes as we did so. But as soon as we did, we heard this loud flapping of wings or running of some large animal. It was so loud that we could feel the vibrations and a sort of wind that came with it. It felt like the animal or thing had stopped right in front of us. I was so terrified I kept my eyes closed, but as soon as I opened them, we both looked around and there was nothing there. We didn't hear it leave, and trust me, we would have. We were spooked, so we booked it back to the cabin. I will preface this by saying that I have never seen a ghost. I believed in them in my youth, and I'd been rather agnostic about my beliefs for a long time, simply believing that anything could exist. The older I got, however, the more skeptical I became. But this happened last night, and I can now firmly say that I'm a believer. My friends and I were in a local park last night. We were walking along a trail and right away, something was off. One of my friends has always experienced the paranormal, and he was extremely uncomfortable. He said he was seeing figures and hearing footsteps throughout the extent of the walk. My other friend and I couldn't see out of the ordinary, so we kind of laughed it off and said that he was just scared, which I now regret doing. It wasn't until we sat down at a tree that things took a turn for the worst. Both of my friends reported feelings of cold dread washing over them that I did not feel. I assumed they just had anxiety. Then my ghost seeing friend stared at the tree line. I asked him if he was seeing one and he said yes. I looked into the woods and I saw it. It was a small wispy figure that had a white gray coloration and seemed to be made out of smoke or mist. It was in constant fluid motion, inverting into itself as if it was barely staying visible. It would bend from just a smoke ball to a small humanoid figure, not childlike, just small, and it would wave. I pointed at it and I asked my friend if it was between the two trees. He said yes. I described what I was seeing. And he said, Oh my gosh, you see it too. We ran out of there after that. I felt the same dread that my other two friends felt, and I could not shake the feeling for the rest of the night. It's all I can think about now. I mean, what was that? It didn't feel like a dead person. I mean, it didn't feel like a person at all. It also didn't feel like it was mocking us. More like it was trying to act in a way that was abnormal for it. Like it was trying to be human. I don't know. I'm an ex-skeptic that's now begging for answers. My friend and I both saw the same thing. And all three of us felt the same thing. So if you have any idea what that was, I'm all ears. So when I was like seven or eight, we used to live in Webster, Wisconsin, and we lived in a house a little bit wider and longer than a trailer house. No upstairs, just the base floor and a basement. It was a beautiful house, 
with a big area that was just woods. One day, my cousin was supposed to be watching my two sisters and I, and he said that we could all go play outside as long as we stayed in his sight. But within five minutes, he ran into the woods and told us to keep up. Of course, we listened to him. We ran after him, and he disappeared. We couldn't see the house or even the tree line where the woods stopped. We were lost, and we started freaking out and crying. Then about a half an hour later, a really tall Native American chief came up behind us and asked us what was wrong and why we were crying. Asked if we were okay, things like that. I told him how we'd been chasing my cousin and we lost him and we don't know how to get back home. He just smiles and says, don't worry, sweetheart. I'll make sure you get home safe and sound. Just come to my village and rest for a little bit. Eat some lunch, play with the children. And when you're ready, you can explain to me where you live. I said, okay. So we go back to his village and it's a smaller one in the middle of the woods in a clearing, but it had at least 60 people. We ate a stew or something like that that they made, and he had me draw in the dirt on the road where our house was. He smiled and said, I know exactly where you live. If you want to play for a little bit, that's okay, but I want to get you home before dark. There are a lot of dangers in these woods, like bears, coyotes, bobcats, not good for children to be out in. So he took us home and he didn't leave the edge of the woods. My mom came out crying, asking where we were, saying she was about to call the cops because we were missing for about four or five hours. She asked us why we left the house without Scotty, my cousin, and I said, he was with us. He ran into the woods and left us behind. We tried to call for him, but he was gone. Then he came outside and said that he had never left the house. He thought we were in our rooms. So I told my mom what happened and she said we would figure it out the next day. The next day we went and followed our footprints and found the village, or what used to be a village. There was almost nothing there. What had been a gorgeous place was now ash. It had all been burned down. The grass, which was shorter the day before, now stood taller than me. It looked like it had just been burned down and left vacant for hundreds of years. We called out for them, but there was no response. We found the chief's headdress and a doll made of deer hide and some other kind of cloth. As we were about to head back, I found a huge eagle feather the size of my arm. It was the most amazing paranormal experience I've ever had. I've been dying to get this story off my chest for years to people who don't think I'm crazy, as it's rather maddening. Before I begin, I don't believe in things like Bigfoot, werewolves, ghosts, supernatural or paranormal stuff in general, but that doesn't mean that I'm able to explain what happened this night. This was a long time ago. I was a teenager. My parents were not very strict, so I had a lot of freedom. I had two friends, and they had their own friends as well. And one of my friend's parents owned this huge part of a forest. My friends, their friends, and I went deep into the woods with a bunch of supplies, and we started making our own treehouse and forts. It was a big part of my childhood, building stuff with my friends, and this place became our sanctuary for a long time, where we'd spend a lot of our time away from the adults. This event happened years after we built the place initially, and also after we rebuilt it because one time it got destroyed. But that's another interesting story for a different time. This is the backstory for all of the events that I'm about to recall. One friend and I spent the night at our sanctuary that we had built, which none of us have ever done before. We only hung out there and then went home. We all planned to spend the night together because it would be fun. Most of our friends weren't allowed to spend the night there, though, because of parents and other things, and one chickened out because he was afraid. So it ended up just being me and one other person, my close friend's cousin. 
We weren't really close at the time, and we fought a lot, but surprisingly, we got along well that night. We spent most of the day swinging from trees, climbing them and hanging out on this tire rope swing while talking. It was a normal day, and then we laid down for rest at about 9 p.m. About 10 minutes after laying down in bed in our sleeping bags, talking to each other under our makeshift tents, we heard rustling. I sat up and saw a very tall silhouette of something that looked to be like a human but was transparent. I could see right through it. I squinted and froze, and it very quickly climbed this tall tree, and as I was looking at it, it disappeared. I was in complete disbelief and shock. I had no idea what I had just seen, if I had seen it at all or if I had hallucinated. I wasn't scared in the moment, just perplexed. Being young and worried though, I said to my friend that we should leave, and not wanting it to hear me, I got close to his ear and just said, there's something in the woods looking at us. After I said that, I saw his facial expression turn to fear, so we got up and started walking down the path out of the woods, calmly. I didn't want to sprint because it might chase, and I also wasn't even sure I'd seen anything. I just didn't want to take any chances. Very shortly after we left, we both got this weird feeling of deja vu and confusion, like we'd been hit with hard drugs or something, except we don't do drugs, and we had only eaten food that we brought from our house. There are also no hallucinogenic plants in our part of the country. Nothing like that. Everything was so slow, and I felt disoriented. But we continued to walk in this direction for quite a while, stumbling in the darkness because of our mental state. I realized that we should have been out of the forest by now. I knew that this was the way out, 110% because I'd been going in and out of this place for years, even in the dark. Yet, I didn't recognize all the trees around us, just the path. It was like our surroundings were changing. My friend randomly yells, yeah, I'm coming, as I'm looking in the opposite direction from him. I turned around, very confused, and asked him why he said that. He said that his mom was calling his name to help lead him out of the forest. I heard nothing. I told him that I didn't hear anything, and he looked at me like I was insane and walked off the path and into the forest. I grabbed his arm and pulled him back, because I didn't want him to get lost. That's when my friend sees the transparent thing that I saw earlier, sitting perched on a tree branch in the direction that his mom was calling him from. He points it out to me. Its transparency is almost like a heat wave effect. We stared at it for 10 seconds in total disbelief. It looked like a transparent being, but we were trying to discern if it was something else and we were just imagining it being alive because there was no movement. But then it hunched down like it was trying to stalk or be stealthy. And very quickly, it climbed up a tree a little more and then went to the next one and then the next one, getting closer to us. We can't hear it at all. It's completely silent, and its silence was exacerbated by the fact that all the other creatures had also gone completely silent, and it was only in that moment that I had really started to realize that. Not a single bug or animal had made a sound since we started leaving camp. This is when our curiosity turned into fear, and once again, we began to see it move. Once it got above us, though, the only thing we could hear was the crunching of the branch as its weight was put down on it. Every little sound that was made was so distinct because it was so quiet and remote. We couldn't see anything because the tops of the trees are so dark. We actually started running, terrified, not worrying about being calm anymore. We heard noises in the trees above us and finally it faded away ahead of us as if it had gone ahead, but the sound was a lot quieter than if a normal animal had been running through the treetops. It sounded as if this thing was very light, but it wasn't very small, so that made no sense. We still kept running forward, despite it sounding like it had gone ahead, and we ended up back at the place that we started. Many, many minutes of walking, and we were back at this place after running for like 20 seconds. It was impossible. 
But instead of staying on the ground, we climbed to the top of the treehouse with our items as quickly as possible and closed the door, wedging a small piece of plywood on it to keep it shut. We heard something climbing up and extremely odd noises as well, almost like the mimicking noises of rain and wind, but there was no water seeping into our treehouse and there would have been had it been raining and it wasn't wet. This persisted for about a minute and then we didn't hear from it again. I'm pretty sure at that point it had left, but we spent the rest of the night there until the sun came up anyway, just in case. When he checked his iPod touch for the first time, right after we closed the door, it was 5 a.m. We started laying on the ground at 9 p.m. Eight hours had passed and what felt to us like no more than 40 minutes of time. Hours after we could start to see the sun through the treehouse slats, we went home. I no longer talked to this friend, but after this incident, we discussed it, and we told everything from both of our points of view, and it all jived. We randomly brought it up to each other every few months and relived it, making sure that we were still on the same page about what happened and that we both remembered. I never spent the night out there again, and... I didn't really even let myself stay out there past 5 p.m. for a very long time. Everything happened this summer when I was working and living in the Chicago area. I don't know much about spirits or paranormal events, so I'll give you the facts of what happened and you can come to your own conclusions. In the first few weeks of my new job, I met this really great guy. We'll call him Paul. We hit it off immediately, and one day he suggested that we go hiking in the woods. I'm originally from Russia, so I was practically raised in the woods. I spent half of my childhood in them and I was really excited about his proposal. As we're hiking, it starts raining, like pouring rain. I've never seen anything like it. We go deeper and deeper into the forest until there are no more paths and we're practically treading swamp water. All this time, we're just talking about random stuff and getting to know each other while not really paying attention to the surroundings. There's no one around since we've gone pretty deep into the woods already and it was pouring buckets. Eventually, we stumble on the skeleton of a teepee, just the bare wooden structure of it, and thought that it was pretty cool, so we kept going in that direction. Suddenly, we both hear someone crying. It sounded like a baby. It is a forest, so lots of animals can imitate that sound like deer, cubs, etc. And the cry sounded distant anyway, so we thought nothing of it and walked forward. Within seconds, we heard this thing right next to us, which seemed strange since it sounded so far away at first. It was so loud now that it could have been a few feet away. We start looking all around, even looking up into the trees, and absolutely nothing was there. It was a pretty weird situation, so we kind of speed walked in the other direction. As soon as we stopped for a break, the sound starts up right next to us again. It was like something was telling us to book it, so we did. We ran faster than what was probably safe in that kind of weather, half looking at Google Maps and half relying on memory. We made it back to the entrance of the woods. Both of us agreed that what happened was pretty weird and decided to look into the history of the place. Immediately, websites like Most Haunted Forests in Illinois started to pop up. Turns out that the place was the site of ancient Native American burial grounds. Not surprising, since a lot of tribes used to live in various parts of Illinois. And apparently, it's where three young boys were brutally murdered and left naked in a ditch. Pretty dark stuff. Paul and I went back and I kind of forgot about the incident until one evening after work, he tells me that he can't stop thinking about the cry and he wants to go back to see what was there. Naturally, I think it's a stupid idea, especially because it was already dark out. 
but then Paul's friend Ryan joins him for kicks. And since I'm worried for both of their safety, 20 something fresh out of college dudes can be very dumb, I come along thinking that at least I could try to keep them out of trouble. So we hop in the car and we drive over there. Traffic is insane and my friend takes a wrong turn. So we get there at around 11 PM. We get out and head into the forest. Now there's no street lights anywhere near us, except right at the edge of the road and flashlights can only do so much. So our visibility is pretty bad. We eventually get to a small wooden bridge that leads us across the river into the actually deep part of the forest. As soon as we cross, I start feeling uneasy. We weren't supposed to be in the woods that late in the first place, but this was a deeper feeling of guilt, like we were intruding or disturbing something that was there. Ryan, who's been leading the way and feeling all confident and cocky, saying that there's nothing out here, stops all of a sudden. On the other side of the bridge, the three of us were hit with this feeling of dread and panic, one that I've never felt before in any forest, and I've been to lots, both in the day and at night. We all exchange nervous looks, and suddenly, we hear crunching, coming toward us from the dark. The feeling at this point gets so intense that Ryan, confidently walking ahead seconds ago, now looks uneasy and says, I think we should go back. We all slowly turn around and start speed walking toward the bridge. No one talks until we get to the other side. And Ryan says, I, I was just nervous because, you know, it might have been a homeless person and I didn't want to deal with that. Right. Eventually, we get to the road where our car was parked along the side. And that's when I see a girl, maybe in her early 20s, just walking along the highway. She was wearing very little clothing and looked a little strange. Her walk wasn't a drunk one. She just seemed to be almost, I don't know the right word for it, but vibrating, undulating, I'm not sure. But there wasn't a building around for miles, just straight road. My stepdad is Malaysian and he's told me a bunch of ghost stories about young ghost women on the side of the road killing drivers. But I was willing to risk it because I didn't want to leave this girl all alone, ghost or no ghost. So I convinced Paul to slow down a bit when we got to her. I called out to her from the passenger window, asking if she needed help. The girl slowly turns around and with the creepiest, slowest smile spreading across her lips, she nods. I was hit with that same feeling that I had gotten back there in the forest and almost regretted slowing down. But whatever, my sense of wanting to help that girl was greater than whatever weird stuff I was feeling. And if I died, well, at least I'd have a clean conscience. She gets in the back of the car, right behind my seat and next to Ryan, and he just starts to chat her up flirting, asking her where she's from and what she's doing. Typical. All this time, I'm turned halfway around keeping an eye on her because I feel like as soon as I turn around and face the road, something bad is going to happen. She's keeping steady eye contact with me the entire time, even when Ryan is talking to her with that slow, creepy smile while slightly undulating. I still don't know what to call it but it seemed snake-like. Ryan asks her where she's coming from and she says, oh, just around. He asks if she's coming from a bar and she nods her head yes, except there's not a single bar anywhere even close, not for miles and miles. She said she was walking home and gives Paul an address, which is 15 minutes away by car along nothing but forest. My eyes literally hurt from keeping eye contact with her and she just keeps smiling and undulating and giving off this feeling of dread. This feeling just keeps increasing. So eventually we drop her off at her street. There are lots of old looking smaller houses there. When I turn back to look at her a second later, she's completely gone. I couldn't sleep that night. I kept imagining her creeping up the stairs her smiling face undulating from the shadows.
Before I tell you my stories, it might be helpful to tell you more about my background. I'm a 23-year-old boy whose family moved during the Yugoslavian War in 1999 from Eastern Serbia to Switzerland. We used to live in a small village across the Danube at the Bulgarian and Romanian border, a region that has a very colorful history. Many bloody historic events occurred on the soil where we lived. Roman emperors used to rule this area as well as many historical figures, such as Attila the Hun, Alexander the Great, or Vlad the Impaler, all of which resided here once and fought battles. The region has been occupied many times, the longest used to be under the Ottomans. This occupation lasted for almost three centuries. After the Ottoman occupation, the country didn't have much time to recover, and the First and Second World War had struck the country already. Many people died during the First World War, about a third of the population. As a result, guerrilla groups like Setniks, Partisans, etc. were formed, killing even more people. In conclusion, many people were unjustifiably tortured and lost their lives, which is probably why there are many occurrences of the paranormal here. Magic is also very common here. The so-called Vlak Magic, or Vlaska Magica, in Valation, is said to be one of the strongest in the world, and many people tend to practice it and religiously believe in it. As a result, there are many stories about paranormal events. One of my favorite ones is a story my grandfather told me. He grew up in the forest in a small and old house, about 300 years old. He was adopted by my great-grandfather, who used to be a leader in one of the upcoming resistance movements against the socialist regime after the Second World War. He fought in both world wars, and even with all this, he took great care of my grandfather and loved him as if he was his own child. Fifty years passed since he left his home, and all of those people living here died, but my grandpa still visits this house and stays overnight there. This place creeps me out. Even during the day, there's an aura to this place that just makes it uncomfortable to be there. I can't imagine staying there overnight, but he frequently does, and one day he told me a very strange story. While he stays there, he says he often gets visited. At first, I thought visit like the ones you get from neighbors or something, but he told me that one night, he woke up to a hand crawling over his head. It was a huge, white, pale man kneeling next to him and sort of crawling over his head, speaking with a calm voice in Vlaski, the dying language that we used to speak here, which is a mix of Moldavian and Romanian. He told me that his skin was white and that it was glowing in the night. He didn't have any hair and the hand felt very soft. My grandfather has always respected the dead and was never really afraid. He told me that he didn't really speak to him and just enjoyed his company, since he knew in some way that he wasn't evil. Another time, he told me that he used to fix small parts around the house. When it started to get dark, he slowly began getting ready to leave his tractor, because it takes like an hour to reach the next civilized place. While putting stuff back into the barn, he heard loud noises in the attic. It didn't bother him until a plank was thrown down the stairs. He recalled one time they even threw down a rock into the wheelbarrow that he was pushing into the barn. He told me he just turned around, locked the barn, and didn't even frown. They expect you to react, he said. Don't give them this pleasure. He told me this while laughing, then said, it makes them go crazy. Growing up, I heard a lot of these stories, and it really does run in our family, having these experiences from time to time. The scariest thing that happened to me occurred during the summer of 2009. My grandfather told me during this summer break, as usual, stories from the past, of how he used to walk these woods alone, in the dark, and what he experienced while doing so. And since I was in my teen years, I started to question the reliability of his stories. From time to time, I took out my old motor bicycle and drove it out into the forest. Driving around was the only time I could really think about stuff and, you know, be in this type of state, 
where you question everything and think about the world. So one day, I took out my bike and decided to drive around. I still don't know why or how, but somehow I found myself driving to the old house that he grew up in. I didn't really bother to question why my intention was to drive there, so I just kept going. I always believed that I was a kid, pure by hearth, and no evil could ever come to me. While I was driving out, I thought about the probabilities of actually encountering a vampire. I live, as I mentioned, in East Serbia, where vampires are still widely believed in. My grandpa always told me not to go out past dark, but I didn't really care, so I still kept going. Remembering back, I thought that his intention was to keep me scared so I didn't get lost in the woods. But being a teenager at the time, I thought I was invincible. And in fact, even if a vampire did cross my path, that I would pass by him with no harm. There aren't really streets there, it's just a dirt road between trees that leads to what seems like nothing. After an hour, even the dirt road started to vanish. While I was driving and thinking about how strong I was, I noticed that my hand felt very wet. I thought it was because I was sweating, since this region can get very hot. After taking a look at my hand, I saw that there was blood all over it. At first I thought it might have been a bug that I had squished, but there was just too much blood for that. So I started to look for wounds, but my hand seemed perfectly fine. My heart slowly began racing, and I took a sharp turn and drove back home. I remember this to be the moment that I was the most scared in my life. I had the urge to look behind me every second that I was driving through the forest. It felt like someone was sitting behind me just waiting for me to fall down. After arriving home and telling my grandpa, he just started laughing and told me never to question their abilities again. This happened a few years ago. I remember it was winter because it was really cold and snowy outside. I was left alone in my family's cabin while the others went Christmas shopping for food and last minute packages for some friends. I don't remember all the specifics of why they went out, but that's not really important. My point is I was all alone in our cabin playing some games on my phone while listening to some music on the radio in my room on the first floor of the cabin. I remember that suddenly I got really cold, so I went to go get a blanket that was on our sofa. Just when I was about to get up and grab the blanket, I saw some kind of shadow from my peripheral vision. I didn't really care that much about it at the time, because I thought maybe it was just my imagination playing a trick on me, because I really don't like being home alone in general and especially not in a cabin on a mountain in the middle of winter. I got the blanket and went back to my room to play some more games. About an hour passed and I had forgotten all about the strange shadow, until I saw it again. But this time it stayed in my peripheral vision for about three to five seconds before it went away again. I was a little creeped out about it now, since I was the only one in the cabin I decided to lock the door to my room, just in case. Right after I locked the door to my room, I heard some kind of crying upstairs on the second floor of the cabin. At first I thought it was my little sister, who was about three years old at the time. She used to cry a lot, so I asked out loud, what's wrong, did you hurt yourself? I heard her answer, yes, I fell while playing with my dolls. Can you come upstairs and help me? I unlocked my door and headed toward the stairs when it finally hit me. I was alone in the cabin, so whatever was upstairs could not be my little sister. I sprinted out of the cabin wearing only a t-shirt, shorts, and my dad's slippers. It was freezing cold outside. I stopped running about 150 meters away from the cabin and looked at it from a distance. In one of the windows on the second floor, 
I could see a shadow just standing still, and I got the feeling that it was staring at me, even though I couldn't make out any eyes. I stood there outside of my family's cabin in the freezing cold for about 30 minutes and cried until my family finally arrived. My mom and dad asked me what was wrong, but I didn't want them to think I was crazy, so I just made up a story. I honestly don't remember what I told them, but they seemed concerned about me. One thing I do remember, though, is that I talked my mom and dad into driving me to my grandparents' cabin because I refused to go back into that one. Ever since that day, I have refused to join my family when they go to our family cabin. It's really hard to explain, but the feeling I got that day at the cabin can only be described as unwanted. Like someone or something wanted to harm me, was trying to lure me. I have nightmares about the shadow figure thing even today. It haunts my dreams, and I'm in no rush to see it again. I live in a super rural area and walk my dog outside in the dark every night. Tonight, I was walking her later than usual, and things felt very off. First we went outside and I walked no more than two feet away from the door and felt something wet under my foot. I checked my shoes and there was a slug in the middle of my shoe. It didn't look like a normal slug, but I don't know what else to call it. I have no clue how it got there, because I know it wasn't there when I put them on. As I'm trying to figure out what the hell is in my shoes, my dog starts freaking out and growling at the house across the street. She does this somewhat commonly because they have dogs that attacked her once, so I didn't think much of it and went inside to get another pair of shoes. I walked back outside and was immediately struck with the feeling that something was wrong. The first time I was out, I heard weird, quiet music, but just thought that the neighbors were playing something. This time, the music was gone, but there was this incessant, high-pitched shriek periodically. My dog and I literally stopped, just stopped, and stood for like a minute, listening. There was this periodic shriek, and then another sound, like a high-pitched bark, Definitely not a fox, I know that sound, and none of the dogs in the area bark like that. This sound would happen every now and again. The worst part was that everything else was dead silent. If you live in the country, you know that it's never silent, not even in the winter. I took a recording on my phone of the noises, but they weren't super loud and it didn't pick them up very well. So I'm feeling a little weird, but I get scared easily, so I try to brush it off and let my dog go to the bathroom. As soon as I stop the recording, my dog starts flipping out, hackles raised, growling, barking, and jumping at something behind us in the yard. She didn't have to tell me twice, so we ran to the door and inside the house. I shut the door behind us and immediately felt relief. I felt like I was being chased, trying to get to the door. My dog ran around the house and did a check out of the windows to make sure everything was clear, I guess, and then went to bed. I don't know what happened, but it scared the crap out of me. I'm hoping that I'm just being paranoid. I was on patrol one night in my town, and we were told to go to some weird place that none of us had ever heard of. Cernan Lake is how it's pronounced. I haven't been able to find it on any maps after the fact, and we had to be directed by dispatch to a back road, which was barely visible from the highway. Grass had grown over most of it, and you could only see tiny gravel rocks here and there. We're no strangers to small towns out in the middle of nowhere, seeing as there's a ghetto calling itself Lake Annette nearby, 
Anyway, someone had reported a woman screaming inside of a motel, and two men had gone into the room and did not come out. Naturally, this sounds like a pretty big deal. So we're sent out there and being guided over radio by dispatch. When we get there, it's basically just a set of eight buildings, one of which is a gas station. There were no pumps, and it was basically just a house with a concrete drive-in. The motel is the closest thing to the road. A bunch of people, maybe about nine, were standing outside the motel. Most of the lights inside were on, and at first we didn't hear any screaming. We tried briefly to talk to the people outside about what was going on, but everyone said something along the lines of, I don't know, I just woke up because of all the screaming. Seeing as this was a potentially dangerous situation, I drew my taser, and my partner drew his service pistol in case the taser didn't work for whatever reason. Thick clothing, probe going off too far to one side, something like that. As soon as we open the front door to the motel, the screaming starts up again. It was incredibly painful to the ears and caused us to run to the room from which it was coming. We yelled in that we were the police, and we went in. As soon as the door is open, the screaming stops, just gone. The room looks completely ransacked, scratches on the walls. No blood though, nothing seems to be missing, just misplaced or damaged. The bathroom was completely clean, no scratches. Closets were empty. We looked under the beds even, and nothing was there. We poked around for as long as we felt was necessary and radioed in that we didn't find anything. We waited for other people to come out and help. We left and went back to the station and wrote up written reports. We still have absolutely no idea what happened. Investigators don't have any idea, and we haven't heard anything from the Lake Town since. I've been having sleep paralysis fairly frequently, hearing scratching on the walls and footsteps as well as nightmares. None of this happened until we went there. I've been working with a psychiatrist to deal with it, currently trying Ambien to see if it'll keep me from experiencing sleep paralysis. I've been tempted to go out there again on my own time, but I haven't been able to work up the nerve. Our department can't afford body cams for everybody since we're a small town department. We can barely afford repairs on our vehicles, so we didn't get any footage. I have no idea what this might have been. I'm leaning towards some kind of elaborate prank, but it just seems odd. Like it would have taken way too much effort to actually fake it to be worth it. We've seen the guy who owns the so-called gas station coming to our gas stations and filling up gas cans. He puts them in the back of his pickup and drives back toward the highway with him. I also asked around as the post office said that they do occasionally get mail to and from there, but it's mostly tax stuff. I haven't been able to find it on any maps. The view is blocked by trees on Google Earth, and you can't really see the turnoff on the highway. I've been having trouble finding really any official records related to it, aside from a case file from the early 90s, before I was even born, about a textbook domestic disturbance. About three years ago, I was on a family vacation to Eastern Washington, and a central aspect of our trip was visiting Lake Paragon State Park. It's an extremely rural area with a tiny western town about a mile away. And that's about it for miles. Anyway, we had just arrived for our 10 day stay in the afternoon, and it was now around 11 p.m. My mom and I left our hotel to go down to the park, as she was really into photography and the moon was full. If you're not familiar, Eastern Washington as a whole is pretty desolate so the night sky is generally incredible with very little light pollution. There were no clouds to be seen and we were a ways down a dirt back road over the park, above the campground, with no real roads anywhere in sight. We got out of the car and took some pictures with nothing more unusual than the eerie silence. About 15 minutes into our visit, we're both facing away from the moon 
looking at the rolling hills. And we notice this odd concentration of light on one hillside, about a quarter mile away. Before either one of us could point it out to the other, the mass of light shining on this hill rolled away into nowhere. It took two seconds and was entirely gone. The whole hillside was brightly lit up, and then nothing. We freaked out and got out of there as fast as humanly possible. We both saw it. There were no other people, no moving clouds, and no roads from which headlights could shine. We still have no explanation for what we witnessed. It was around 10 p.m., and my friends and I decided that it was a good idea to play hide-and-seek at 11 p.m. So when we started to play, I ran into the middle of the forest, where I hid. Around a tree, I saw a woman in a white dress, just staring at me. Obviously, I got scared and ran outside of the forest. On the way out, I got a cut that was about three or four inches long on my left hand. I only saw it when I was clear of the woods. When my friends got the balls to do it and go in there, they saw her too. We all ran to the highway, which was about 200 feet away. The night passed and we didn't play anymore, but I had a camera at home, which I didn't use anymore. I decided to put a 128 gigabyte SD card in it and place it near the tree that I had hid around to let it record anything. When my friend went to get it, he said that the woman appeared on the camera until 3 a.m. when she suddenly disappeared. Unfortunately, we have since lost the footage, but either way, it was a very scary experience. I lived in Germany for many years while my father was stationed there in the U.S. Army. We lived off base in private housing, and I loved it. That country is amazing. The vast forests, the mountains, the countryside, the farmlands, the little towns, everything. I quickly became really good friends with some local boys whose parents owned the town's dairy farm. We were always in the forests, running around and exploring fishing, playing army, stuff like that. I was around eight or nine years old at that time, and I'm over 40 now. One night, I stayed late at the farm hanging out with the guys. I left at about nine or ten-ish. It was dark, but the moonlight gave pretty good vision. I lived just across the soccer field and then across a small cornfield from the farm. As I'm walking through the soccer field, I see a bit of movement just really quickly, out of the corner of my eye along the tree line at the edge of the field. I quickly stepped up my pace. As I turn to take my usual path through the cornfield to my house, I see at least a half a dozen silhouettes emerge from each side of the rows of corn on the sides of the path. I froze. They just stood there. And then all of a sudden, there's one standing behind me. Before I can snap around and get out of there, he asks in German where I'm going. I turned around, and what I see surprises but also relieves me. I answered in English and told him I was headed home. He was then curious about my English. Turns out it was a team of special forces operators. I mean, these guys were decked out so much in tactical gear I couldn't comprehend how they were able to move so stealthily. Night vision goggles, packs, bags, weapons. There was even a dog. They looked like total badasses. Apparently they were using these small towns to do some off-base training. I just happened upon them this particular night. I will never understand why they chose to break cover and show themselves. They could have easily just stayed put and I would have walked right by them none the wiser. But they all walked me home as it was on their way back. It started off super creepy, but it was actually pretty cool. 
and it's an experience that I will never forget. I went for a casual night walk in the woods with my friend. We were walking along the path, along the river, and talking. Then we decided to stop for a while and sit on a bench that was right there next to the path facing the forest. The river was flowing behind us. We were sitting there for quite a while, just talking about random things. I suddenly started to hear a soft tinkling, like a small bell ringing, almost like a bicycle bell or a dog's leash, every now and then. I didn't pay much attention to it at first, but it kept getting closer and more frequent. So I told my friend about it. He confirmed that he could hear it too, so I started to listen a bit more closely. I looked in the direction that it was coming from, expecting to see somebody riding a bicycle or walking a dog at any second. That wouldn't be too unusual, as we used to go there quite often, and even in the middle of the night, we would come across a few people going on a walk with their dog. The moon was shining brightly, so I could see a silhouette if there was a person coming toward us. But I could only hear the ringing, getting closer, and more frequent. Out of nowhere, my gut told me that we should leave, so I told my friend and we started to walk away. I walked a little faster than usual, as I was a bit creeped out already. And after a while of not hearing a thing, it suddenly ringed about two meters away from us. We both just started running. We could hear it ring close behind us a few more times, and then it suddenly stopped. We could hear that we were getting away from it. When we got back to the city, we talked about it, and we realized we both heard it from different sides. I had clearly heard it coming from the left, but he heard it coming from the right. So how did we hear it coming from different directions? Only when it got close to us, and we started running, could we hear it coming from the same place. The worst thing about it all is that both of us could hear it, so it couldn't be my imagination. That and I got that weird gut feeling of danger that I've never experienced before or since. I was hiking a section of the North Umpqua Trail in the northern part of Southern Oregon a few years back with my sister-in-law. It's a 72-mile trail broken into sections that can be easily hiked in a day. At the time, I lived about midway up the trail, fairly remote, in a small community. It was mid-fall this one day when we set out. The trail was running along the south side of the North Umpqua River and was pretty up and down in the beginning. We made it to a fairly flat section that was running just above the river. There was this beautiful view of the river through the trees, so we stopped to get some pictures and take a water break. I immediately felt extremely uncomfortable, like somebody was watching us. I slowly turned my head to look behind us, across the trail and up. At the top of this very small incline, I could see a small meadow through the trees. Across the meadow, maybe 15 yards from us, was a tent. An old canvas-style tent. As I'm looking, I notice bones strung from the trees all around the meadow, like creepy death wind chimes. My stomach just clenched and dropped. I leaned into my sister-in-law and whispered, Do not, not turn around and look behind us. Just continue walking up the trail and run when I tell you. We were close enough to the river that nobody who wasn't immediately next to us could have heard this. She did exactly as I told her to do, setting off at the brisk walk we'd been at before. We got maybe 10 yards and I could hear footsteps through the forest floor, coming from behind and slightly above us. That part of the forest is very dense. There's thick moss cover under the trees, so footsteps on it make a very specific sound. 
I leaned forward and told her to pick up her speed. She did. I did. And so did whoever was behind us. I leaned forward again and told her to run as fast as she could and not to stop until I told her so. For two middle-aged women, both slightly overweight, we ran like the wind. I just kept telling her, go, go, go. I could see ahead of us that the trail had an incline and then veered to the right along the river and around a cliff. I knew at that point that whoever it was was going to have to come down onto the trail or stop. We kept running. We probably ran at least a mile after that, even though we could no longer hear anybody behind or above us. That section of the trail was about nine miles, and we weren't halfway when this happened. We eventually slowed down, but just hurried as fast as we could the rest of the way. We had arranged for her younger brother to pick us up. We made it to the next trailhead fairly early, so we made our way out to 138 and started walking east toward home, knowing that he would find us. He did, and was shocked at our story. We got home and immediately called our local sheriff, who lived just above us at the ranger station. He came to the house and heard our story. He explained that it might be a day or two before they could get on the trail as they had a missing hunter at the time that they were searching for. So a few days go by and he shows up at our house to let me know that we weren't crazy or imagining things and that somebody really did chase us. I asked what they found and who it was. He looked at the floor and then looked up and said, I'm not going to tell you what we found or who it was because if I do, You'll never hike anywhere ever again. What we found was not normal, and it won't happen up here again. He then instructed me to never, ever hike unarmed again. I never found out what they found, or who it was. I never hiked that section of trail again, and it completely burned last year. I also never hike unarmed, ever. That was huge for me because I wasn't really a gun person at the time. But I am a living person and I'd like to stay that way, so I took his advice. I had many incidents living up there in the national forest with wild animals and other strange things, but nothing ever scared me as much as another human did that day. When I was young, I attended the local scout group based in my village in Hampshire. The amount of things that I learned from scouts and the lessons that it taught me are innumerable, but one particular memory stands out. Once on a camp at an old scouting campsite, I remember we were playing a game at night, which was World War II themed. Our leader loved creating military themed games. In this game, each team had a bomb a colored string of wool, that they had to fix to the enemy base, which was a random piece of rope that was put up in the woods, making sure not to get caught by the enemy soldiers, which were the leaders carrying flashlights. As somewhat of a tactician, I departed from the other scouts, who were heading straight down the main path toward the enemy base, and also toward the leaders, instead opting to flank around deep into the woods which took longer, but proved to be more successful in the dark. Eventually, deep in the woods and on my way to another bombing run, I heard the distant sound of the whistle. This signaled that the game was over and that everyone should return to the camp. I began making a leisurely stroll back through the darkness. I can't remember if I was alerted by sight or by sound, but my attention was drawn to a short silhouette walking through the woods about six to eight meters away. Assuming that this was one of the younger scouts who was also returning to camp, I decided that it would be funny to try and scare them by making growling noises. Immediately after making the noises, the silhouette stopped dead in its tracks, turning toward me. In the darkness, I couldn't make out any of their clothes or features, but I could clearly see the blacked out silhouette of a child. After the figure had clearly noticed me, but not made a sound, 
I decided to carry on making growling noises. But then the silhouette just turned around and began to walk away from me. They were clearly unfazed by my attempt to scare them. So I figured that I would just follow them back to camp. However, after a few steps, the figure literally face planted into the ground, still about eight meters in front. I jogged a bit to catch up with them and make sure they were okay. But upon reaching where they were, there was no trace of anyone. Confused, I looked around for a short while, seeing if they had scrambled off. But there was no noise of someone running away, and I didn't notice them get up. They had just vanished. Still in a state of confusion, I continued to walk back to the camp alone. I didn't really tell anyone until years later when it clicked in my brain that things just didn't add up. Something else that sticks in my memory from that camp, which is probably unrelated but still strange, was that part of the woods had been cut down and the grounds heavily churned up by some sort of heavy duty machine. Whilst exploring this area, some of my friends and I found an old leather briefcase that looked like it had been churned up by whatever machine had been in the area. Upon opening the briefcase, we found a really old scouting uniform, think sand colored and military style with shoulder lapels, with quite a few loose badges and some other personal items that I can't remember. I don't know if it was related to the boy or not, but it's still kind of strange. It was somewhere in the middle of the White Mountains in the summer when I walked into what looked like a scene from a horror movie. A person with zero hiking, camping, or other experience had gotten themselves into trouble. Big trouble. It was around 7 a.m. when I found the campsite. The first thing that hit me was the eerie stillness until I noticed the shredded tent under a tree and the desperate looking human figure covered in blood, whimpering quietly. I put my bag down, grabbed my kit, and went over to the person. They looked like they had just lost a knife fight with a four-armed man. Deep slashes from one shoulder to the hip, single punctures up and down his back, and hands and forearms full of what looked to be defensive cuts. I patched him up the best I could, gave him water, checked my map, and hightailed it to the closest road. This was before cell phones were super prevalent and barely worked in the mountains. Thankfully, the road was very close by, less than two miles, and I was able to flag somebody down. They took off and I waited for assistance to arrive. It took about an hour until rescue got there. I led them to the still unidentified individual. He wasn't very conversive when I first found him. I was sure he'd be dead before we got there, but I was wrong. I assisted rescue bringing him out and took them up on their offer to head into town and get cleaned up. After cleaning up and getting myself situated at their station, I went on my way, leaving them my number to call to let me know what was up with the person that we had helped. I got home three days later, and there was a message on my machine. Story goes that the guy I found decided to go camping one day and heard that he had to keep food hung from a tree to keep bears away. Well, he did that, but he put it almost directly over his tent, and not high enough. The night before I happened upon the site, a bear had used the tent, and its occupant, in an attempt to climb the tree to get the food. The guy had woken up to four black bear paws sinking into his body, shifting to reach up. The guy survived and swore to the hospital staff that he was moving to the city and never going into the woods again. These events occurred two summers ago in the Grand Teton area. My boyfriend at the time, now husband, let's call him Harry, was an avid outdoorsman and also served in the military. I was an ecology major and wanted to spend more time outdoors. So he decided to take me on my first backpacking trip, 
just the two of us. For those who aren't familiar, the Grand Tetons are well known for their wildlife, specifically grizzly bears. My only experience with bears up to this point was watching a little black bear cross the road from the safety of my car. Seeing grizzly country signs around every corner wasn't doing much to calm my nerves. The first incident. My boyfriend looked like Indiana Jones, machete hanging from his belt, large knives attached to each side of his pack, bear spray strapped to his waist. You get the picture. The beginning of our 25 mile journey was all uphill. When in bear country, you're supposed to make noise so as to not startle the wildlife by accidentally sneaking up on it. As you can imagine, going up a steep hill while carrying a 40 pound pack makes it a little difficult to make conversation. We were an hour in and almost at the top of the ascent. I noticed that the woods had gone completely silent save for the rushing stream that was to our left of the trail. Silent woods are never a good sign. This usually indicates that predators are nearby. At this point, I was in front of my boyfriend and we were about to crest the hill. For the past 20 minutes, we hadn't said a word to each other, having been too tired to speak. We noticed the silence at the same time and gave each other knowing glances. I came up over the top of the hill and immediately froze. Sitting not 10 feet in front of me in the middle of the trail was a grizzly bear. My husband wasn't aware yet as he was behind me. So I did the first thing I could think of. While still in my frozen stance, I managed to take my arm and start flinging it wildly behind me trying to get Harry's attention. I was too terrified to speak. The bear went from sitting to all fours, not looking away from us once. Harry quickly swung me around so that I was behind him and he just started yelling. Being in the military, he knows how to yell. The grizzly wasn't quite phased as it started to walk slowly toward us. At this point, I was on the verge of passing out from terror. This bear was about five feet in front of us when we heard a loud crack coming from the woods to our right. The bear heard it too, and he bolted toward the stream. A second crack boomed again, this time much closer than before. My boyfriend said, it's probably just some falling branches but we both knew that wasn't the case. At this point, we were walking quickly up the trail in an attempt to create some distance from the grizzly and those strange noises. I felt the hairs on the back of my neck stand straight up. And at the same moment, my boyfriend stopped moving in front of me. He turned around to look at me and I turned around to look behind me. To this day, we're not sure what we saw. Back where we had been standing was a large black brown mass. It looked to be three times bigger than the already large grizzly that we had seen just a few moments before. Its back was facing us and then it stood on its hind legs. It looked similar to a bear, but something about the shape was just off. At this point, it was probably stupid to run away, but that is exactly what we did. We were aware of heavy footsteps behind us, but neither of us looked back. The footsteps eventually faded. At this point, I was a mess. My boyfriend was doing his best to console me. Honey, this is extremely unusual. The bears usually stay away from humans. We're going to be okay. I'm sure that won't happen again. That was enough to convince me to continue on the backpack. Not another hour later though, we reached a clearing where we decided to take a rest and have a snack. 
About a minute after we had sat down, I noticed bushes moving in a line toward the clearing, toward us. Out of the brush comes this adolescent grizzly, who looks just as spooked as I'm sure we did, but he came straight for us. My husband, being the crazy nut that he is, decided to charge back at the bear while screaming, bear spray at the ready. That did the trick, and the bear ran off. All I could think was, just my luck. But that wasn't even close to what happened the second night. Night two. Before we began our backpack, we had to let the ranger station know which trails and route we planned to take. With this information, they usually send a ranger on horseback at some point during the backpack to check on you, just to make sure everything is okay. There weren't many approved trails left for us to choose from, and it was just our luck that they were the most difficult. Apparently, over the three days that we were on those trails, we had been the sole hikers. We didn't see a single other person once we were en route. However, I guess we missed the ranger who came to check on us. We had been following hoof prints the entire second day, and we hadn't seen any the day before. I had some foot problems, so we spent valuable daylight trying to adjust my boots, laces, and socks to compensate for the pain. When we started on the trail again, we had maybe an hour or two of daylight left, and in the woods, it gets dark fast. I was exhausted. It was now dark out, and Harry was the only one with a working headlamp, as mine wouldn't even turn on for some reason. We needed to find somewhere to set up camp, as we still needed to eat. It was freezing, and the wind was blowing. It was creating a howling sound as it rushed through the trees, which made it difficult to hear Harry or discern any other sounds coming from the woods. After another hour of hiking through the dark, we found a clearing. Well, it was more like a bowl. It looked to be about 200 meters in diameter, with the sides being about 10 meters down from the trail to the bottom of the clearing. This place was strange. We both felt it, though he didn't tell me how freaked he was until after we had left. There was no moonlight, so all we had was the illumination from his headlamp, our small camp stove, and the flashlight that I had fished from my pack. Half of the trees were dead or fallen, but just in the bowl. The vegetation everywhere else was very dense. To help alleviate my anxiousness, he started playing some music out of his portable speaker. This didn't help much, as it just echoed off the trees, creating a dissonance of sounds. He also thought that it would ward off any predators nearby. This is when we knew our anxiety was not paranoia. The silence was back. There hadn't been a single bird chirp since we arrived at the clearing. It also may have had to do with the obnoxious music, but because of our previous experience, we decided to turn off the music and head into the tent. Aside from everything else, it was freezing. As soon as we were situated in our sleeping bags, we heard deep cracks and thuds echoing from beyond the tree line. Falling trees? There had been a lot of wildfires and very little rain this season. Thud. We both froze. That sound wasn't an echo. It came from inside the clearing, and it was definitely not a falling tree. Thud. It came from right outside our tent. We both stopped breathing. Harry's hand found mine, and we clung to each other, paralyzed. Something dragged across the outside of our tent, making an indent as it went along. It was thin, almost like a finger. What is it? I whispered, shaking. 
I don't know. It shouldn't be a person. We're the only ones on this side of the mountain. I was trying my hardest to stifle sobs, trying to listen to what was outside. I could hear steps, but I couldn't decipher what it was. The steps stopped, and then the whole side of the tent was slowly pushed inward. At this point, whatever was outside knew we were inside, so I shined my flashlight at the side of the tent. What I saw made my blood run cold. Pressed into the tent wall was the shape of a human face. I could make out the nose, an open mouth. Each time they breathed, it made the tent around their mouth billow in and out. Harry said, F that, and pulled a Glock from his sleeping bag. He cocked it, and the sound shattered the silence. The face pulled back, and we heard fast footsteps heading toward the edge of the clearing. We didn't leave the tent till the sun was shining the next morning. The first thing we noticed was the smell of urine. We came out of the tent and looked around. Whoever it was had peed on our coals that we had left on the fire, leaving a disgusting stench of evaporated pee. Footprints surrounded our tent, circling around it multiple times. Muddy handprints decorated the outside of our tent. At least, we think it was mud. The takeaway? Wildlife is not the most dangerous thing in the backcountry. telling this story for 80% entertainment value and 20% feedback. This is entirely true. I'm not a spiritual person. I'm resistant to energies and vibes, though I do believe that there are others who are more tapped into their surroundings than I am in that regard. And I'm a cynic with most paranormal things, except Bigfoot. I believe in the Squatch, but we ain't talking about him. I live in the foothills of Western North Carolina, near the base of the Blue Ridge. I lived in the mountains for a few years and hated it up there. I despise the woods with a burning passion. Yet, just my luck, I've moved back in with my folks, in their cabin, surrounded by woods. The land my family owns stretches across about 15 acres of woodland. Now. These are the woods I grew up in. Despite my typical aversion to nature, I do feel pretty safe in them. I climbed the trees and splashed in the creek and played with stick swords when I was a kid. These woods are home, except for the area behind the backyard. Our cabin is positioned at the top of a pretty steep hill that slopes down for about a half mile before it bottoms out at a creek down in the woods. The halfway point between the house and the creek is this little patch of woods right behind the fenced in area around the house. It's always in shade, no thick undergrowth, just trees, Carolina red clay, piles of leaves, the usual, but it feels really weird down there in a way that I can't explain. I feel very unwelcome out behind the house, and I'm not the only one. My parents avoid it too. Even our pets, past and present, have always steered clear of it. I'm going to list some experiences that might get my point across better. A. I was about eight or nine, and one summer, I thought I'd try camping in the backyard. I set up my family's unused tent, loaded it up with an air mattress and a pile of blankets, copper, my beloved deer stuffy, and some comic books. I guess I wanted to be excited about it, but even before the sun went down, when my mom was helping me set up my little camping trip, I felt 
uneasy. The shady patch of woods around the backyard was just weird, but I was a kid, so I figured, screw it, I'm 20 feet from the house, I'll be fine. I was not fine. I got set up for the night, stayed up reading comics, felt like an outdoorsman, and it had barely gotten dark when I began hearing loud, rhythmic crunching in the woods behind the backyard, like something big was walking in circles around the undergrowth. We don't have bears in my neck of the woods. Besides, whatever it was, it was definitely walking on two legs. It never tried to approach the backyard, even as I sat there with copper, just listening to it. It just kept walking. I barely lasted an hour in that tent before running inside and getting into my own bed. B. My mom is an avid gardener and decided that she was going to put together four or five raised gardening beds in the backyard for herbs and veggies. This was when I was 11-ish, so naturally I was roped in to help. We spent the first part of the spring putting them together and getting them started. I began noticing that both of us would get really edgy and irritable back there. We're best friends and we never fight, but we would be snapping at each other, constantly raising that stupid garden. I also noticed for the first time that the woods behind the house are deathly quiet. Playing music or talking didn't make any difference. It was that kind of silence that presses in on you. And it's always like that back there. The beds actually thrived for a little while, but mom would always ask me to come with her when she tended to them. I thought it was silly at the time. When I got older though, she told me she just couldn't be down there by herself. She'd wait until I was home from school before checking on them because she too felt uneasy and unwelcome. Eventually, we just abandoned the project. The raised beds are still down there, by the way, just rotting away in the undergrowth. I haven't checked on them since middle school and I'm 23 now. C. Lastly, and in my opinion, the creepiest, was the time that I asked mom to cut my hair. We were poorer then, so rather than go to a salon, mom just gave me a twice monthly trim. It was late spring and warm, so she suggested we cut it in the backyard for easier cleanup. I was maybe 13 or 14 at this point. So we ventured down, I brought a stool, and I sat diligently while she cut my hair. Side note, my mom has always cut my hair, so she's very good at it. She doesn't make mistakes. This is important. As she worked and we talked, I noticed that the old familiar feeling of unease was back. We were not welcome back there. The tree stood still and shadowy despite the brilliant sunny day. And I remember that it was cold, very cold. Mom finished up my haircut and I shook off the extra debris to let her admire her handiwork. She stepped around in front of me, angled my head this way and that, and said it looked good. Three things happened then in very quick succession. First, I felt this squeeze of pressure on my lungs, like I couldn't breathe. It was such a weird sensation that I just froze. All of the uneasiness of the atmosphere pressed in on me all at once. Second, my mom got this weird, vacant look on her face. I remember her smile fading and her eyes going a little glassy, like she was lost in thought. And then she reached out with the scissors, still making this empty expression and snipped a deep cut into the skin over my left eye. I freaked out, jumped down off the stool, and backed away. At that same time, the third thing happened. She seemed to gather herself again. 
She was almost in tears. She apologized over and over again. We didn't even bother to take anything with us as we ran back up to the house to treat the cut and stop the bleeding. I still have a little scar there and she's never forgiven herself for it. There wasn't even a hair hanging over that eye either. I had a pixie cut at the time. So, yeah, a few of the many weird experiences that make me avoid the backyard now. I haven't even been down there in seven or eight years, but now that I'm living here again, I just sometimes look into the backyard and feel that weird shudder of apprehension. So what's the deal? Why don't we feel welcome in a 50 square foot patch of land that we own? Why is it so dark and quiet all the time? I have no idea, but my parents and I, we just work around it and pretend it isn't there. A couple of years ago, my pops and I decided to go on a road trip. It was very out of the blue. I wasn't even expecting it, but I decided to go anyway. It would be some solid father-son bonding time. After driving for what seemed like a couple of hours, it was maybe around 8 to 9 p.m., we pulled up into this gas station for snacks and water and to use the bathroom. And we went back inside our car. Keep in mind, this gas station was basically in the middle of nowhere. Anyway, we got back into our car and decided to look for a motel, but there were none. And I mean, there wasn't a single one anywhere near us. My dad was really tired, so we decided to sleep in the car. We pulled up into this sort of resting area slash parking lot and decided to go to sleep. My dad fell fast asleep, but I was on my phone for a couple of hours and around 11 p.m., I just felt suffocated by the tense air, and I decided to step out for a bit. I felt safe because the gas station was still in sight, and there would be a couple of trucks that would occasionally drive by, so I felt at ease. At this time, I was also texting my friend who lives in Seattle, Washington, and we were on the phone for a bit. Then I saw what looked like a large cornfield, I was a city guy, so I'd never seen a cornfield in real life. So I decided to cross the road and just get a closer look. So that's what I did. I walked extremely close and started feeling like I was being watched. But again, I thought, well, you're literally outside in the dark standing next to a tall cornfield. Of course you're gonna feel weird. So I brushed it off. I even considered going in, but then I thought, why would I even do that? So anyway, I decided to just take a step back when I noticed a barn, a large white barn with red, maybe black strips. It was hard to tell in the dark, but it surely was a barn. And I was stupid and young when this happened, maybe 14 or 15. So out of curiosity, I decided to just check it out. The barn was next to the cornfield, kind of tucked in a little. I literally thought to myself, I wish I could see something that would freak me out as a joke because I never really thought that anything would happen and I love being scared. Anyway, I started making my way toward the barn. Getting closer and closer, I remember very vividly that I was wearing no socks and just slip on slides. I remember the dirt rubbing against my toes while I walked. I remember sending pictures to my friend in Washington jokingly saying that I saw something and I was gonna go check it out. As I got closer, I did see something. Behind the barn, but sort of to the side, like how when someone peers from a corner. At first, I thought it was a bell. Literally, I assumed that it was just a bell attached to the corner of the barn. So I just walked closer. I kept moving toward it. And then I saw the head of something or someone just peering around the corner at me. At that moment, I straight up froze. My flight or fight was out of function, apparently, because there I was literally seeing someone or something peering at the corner, and I didn't do either of those things. 
After about five to 10 seconds, the noise that Snapchat makes when you get a notification snapped me out of it. And I just ran as fast as I could across the road to my dad's car and got in. I felt a sense of relief wash over my body. And somehow my dad was not awake. Me gasping for air wasn't enough to stir him from his sleep, I guess. I really considered waking him up and telling him that we have to leave and telling him what I saw, but he would assume that I was joking or having some kind of episode since he's never believed in anything paranormal or out of the ordinary at all. I took deep breaths and just texted my friend telling her what I saw, but she didn't believe me. I don't blame her and I won't blame any of you either if you don't believe me. I have a hard time actually believing what I saw sometimes, but I know it was real. I was sober and fully aware, but from the bottom of my heart, the part that disturbs me the most is that whatever was peering at me from around that corner was very tall, at least seven, maybe eight feet tall. And every time I think about that, I get a sense of dread and paranoia. I haven't told any of my family, not even my dad, but if any of you have a clue of what I might have seen, let me know. I wasn't hallucinating. And this was way before I figured out anything to do with psychedelics or drugs in general. I've been trying to piece it together ever since it happened. I was sort of 50-50 on paranormal encounters before, but after that experience, I believe. I believe in walkers and windigos and ghosts and everything pretty much. It's completely changed me. I want to know what's out there. I want to know what I encountered. I'm a sheriff's deputy in a fairly busy county. Along with the job comes the unfortunate familiarity with what a decomposing human body smells like. To me, it's very similar to an animal carcass, but with a much sweeter odor. Not sweet in the sense that I enjoy it, hell no. That smell normally means a bad night for me and another gruesome memory to add to my catalog of things I would rather forget. With that out of the way, I'll get to what happened. Last night, I was patrolling a geographically isolated area of the county, which is very large and sparsely populated. Having completed the hour-long trek to the northwestern county line, I began driving through the mountains back toward civilization. About 25 miles from town, or the closest semblance thereof, I hit a straight stretch of highway through a wide valley. Since the weather was nice, I had my windows rolled down. As I passed the entrance of an old logging road, that familiar smell of sweet rot suddenly filled my car. Not just a whiff, a cloud of it filled the cab as if there was a weak old human corpse sitting in the front seat next to me. It was all too familiar, but this time there was something else that I couldn't place. It lingered for a few moments, then went away just as quickly as it had entered. Realizing what I had just smelled, my heart sank and I pulled to the side of the road. I told myself it was just a dead animal in the ditch and that my mind was playing tricks on me. I turned my car around and drove slowly back toward the logging road. The closer I got to it, the smell became stronger and I grew more certain that I was about to find a body. Holding on to a shred of hope that I was wrong, I parked my unit on the side of the highway just before the dirt road. I radioed to dispatch, told them my location and that I would be out of my unit for a moment. I didn't say why to avoid an awkward disregard on a possible body on the side of the road. I shined my flashlight into the ditch and into the encroaching briars and weeds as I walked closer to where I believed the source of the smell was. Once I was a few yards away from the dirt road, I saw the opening of a concrete culvert going under the highway. At this point, the smell was nearly as strong as it had been when I first passed. The opening of the culvert was about three feet in diameter, just large enough to hide a body inside. 
I cursed and held my breath as I leaned over and shined my light inside. An empty tunnel stretched the width of the highway. Somewhat relieved, I stood and looked around. It smelled as if I was standing on top of whatever was emitting the odor. I searched around the brush for a moment, but found nothing. Thinking the origin might be on the opposite side of the highway, I crossed to the other ditch to continue searching. As I walked away from the other side of the road, the smell grew faint. I stopped at the opposite end of the culvert and peeked inside, just to double check. The odor was nearly gone at this point. I stood up and checked my surroundings when I heard a crack in the brush behind me and the smell engulfed me even stronger than before. Thinking for a moment that the wind must have shifted, I froze when I realized the air was dead still. Whether it was fear or something else, a shiver went down my spine. In the distance, I saw headlights coming down the highway. As the car came near, the odor seemed to move away, farther into the bushes toward where I had heard the crack. The car stopped and the passenger rolled down the window and asked if I was all right. I lied and told him that I was. I thanked him for checking and I walked briskly to my car as they drove away. I got the hell out of there. Once I was able to get cell service, I called my friend who was patrolling the opposite side of the county. I explained what had happened, trying not to let on that I was spooked. Once I was done, he paused for a moment, then asked about the unusual hint of something which accompanied the smell. He asked if it was sulfur, and I put two and two together. It was sulfur that I had smelled. I asked if he thought I had found a demon in the middle of nowhere, to which he responded with a concerned, yes. This guy is the son of a missionary and has been all around the world. He has seen, rather smelled, this before and told me that it was a very concerning experience. This spooked me even more because his responses were very out of character for him. Maybe something else happened. Maybe there's some shred of a possibility that there's a scientific explanation. But honestly, I think I agree with my friend. I think there's a demon in the valley. In Sydney, there's this National Park Drive where people complete runs which consist of trying to complete the drives within a timestamp. I've been doing these so-called Nasho runs for a while now with my best friend. Nothing has ever happened before, and the drive through the park is spooky at night, sure, but I've always found comfort in the woodlands or in night drives, so I never really thought anything of it. A few nights ago, three of my friends and I went for a Nasho run, and exactly at the halfway point, we hit a pothole pretty hard, which resulted in a flat tire so we pulled over to the side on a long road. This place has no reception, and it's in the middle of nowhere, with no way of walking through or back. We had a spare tire, but no change kit, so I had one friend on call for help, which was a pain due to the lack of reception. My best friend panics a lot, so she was on the verge of crying, and I was rummaging through the boot for a wrench and a jack. About 20 meters away was a parked car, which was strange because the last house we passed was about a kilometer away, but we just shrugged it off. Later on in the dead of night, we hear a group of friends laughing, and this spooked my friends so they stayed in the car. I told them I was going to follow the laughter and ask if they had a change kit in their parked car. Nate insisted on coming with me. We walked 20 meters to the parked car and nobody was in there. It gets pretty freaking dark, so I tell him to turn on his flashlight, which he does. We turn a corner on a gravel road, and once we do, we see a woman standing there with her back toward us. The group laughter had stopped, which left us in the dead of night, in complete silence, in the middle of nowhere, with this random woman who was just standing there. 
but she looked pretty normal to me, so I approached her slowly. I said, hey. She didn't turn around or react at all. So I stopped in my tracks, but Nate continued walking toward her. He stopped about five meters away behind her. I yelled out, Oi! And again, she didn't turn around. We weren't able to see her face, but something just wasn't right. She was tall, in all white, but I looked at Nate and he just stood there, and under his breath, he muttered my name and told me to go repeatedly. So I turned around and started walking back. By the time we passed the car, we started running back to our car. We sat inside and I asked what happened and he said that something was wrong because a woman just shouldn't be standing there by herself in pitch darkness in the middle of a gravel road. In addition to that, she didn't react to us or our source of light. He said he just felt ominous about it all. We told our other two friends and Nate was very shaken up. They sort of laughed it off. And when we ended up finally changing the tire, we turned the car back around and stopped right where we had seen the woman. I rolled the window down and shined my flashlight on the gravel road. The woman was gone though. No more laughter, just silence. I thought maybe I had imagined her, but we stood right there and Nate was right behind her. However, every single one of us heard the group laughter and there's a fair share of paranormal stories about this area but up until then I'd never really paid attention to it. I know it doesn't sound like much, but at the time, it was so crazy. Something just felt so, so wrong. And the way the laughter got relatively loud the closer we got but then came to a total halt once we saw her, something was just wrong. This is one of the many things that I have never told to anyone before, because I'm pretty sure that nobody would have believed me, thinking that my imagination was just wild, and sometimes I still doubt that anybody will believe me. But I remember this happening for real, so I wanted to share. This thing happened to me in the past when I was around nine, and I always used to hang out with my oldest cousin, who was seven back then. We were pretty inseparable at the time, before everything changed when he turned 18. I was spending the night at my granny's house, as I used to be her personal dog sitter, and he decided to come hang out with me. He suggested that it was a good idea to go into the nearest forest, which was almost right next to her house. We were living in a medium-sized city, but the forest is almost always near buildings at some parts or areas. Around 10 or 11 p.m., we decided just to walk to the edge of the forest, since it would have been completely foolish to go deep into the forest that late. I told him that that would be a good idea, since we were both kind of bored and feeling adventurous. We headed out and just started to walk toward the edge of the forest, both up for having a small adventure. But that didn't even last a half hour before the weird things started to happen. I remember when I was standing against a big tree and looking just in front of me, my cousin was near my side, like six or seven inches away from me. I was looking in front of me and I felt like I was searching for something. I'm still unclear of what exactly it was, but I was just looking. All of a sudden, I saw red eyes staring at me from out of nowhere, but they were really far from us. I turned toward my cousin and asked if he was seeing what I was, but he ignored my question. So I turned back to look at the eyes and they were much closer than before. I blinked a few times, but of course I couldn't see anything around them and they weren't getting closer. I just saw trees. I turned back to him and asked the same question, but he kept ignoring me. So I turned one last time to look at them to see that they were even closer and closer. I just kept watching them, feeling a little bit afraid at this moment. And I swear that they started to come toward me, even when I didn't look away. So I just grabbed his hand and ran as quickly as I could, 
until we saw the street lamps. After that, I've never seen or experienced the same thing ever again. The weirdest thing in hindsight is that I never heard it getting closer. I never heard anything at all. Even if it had been like a wolf or a dog or something like that, I would have heard rustling or branches or something. But there was just nothing. It's been 16 years since this happened, and it has always stayed with me. I distance hike when I can. Sometimes this means getting up early or staying out late to get as many miles in as possible. Sometimes walking in the pitch dark with a low light headlamp gets spooky. I grew up in the woods of this area. I've slept under the canopy of stars more nights than I can count. I've trekked thousands of miles of trail, river bank, lake shore, ridge bottoms, bogs and creeks. I've hunted the game. I'm establishing this because it's important that you understand that I have heard, seen, and smelled about all this region has to offer in the way of wilderness. My scariest experience, though, happened at about 4.30 in the morning. It was late spring, so the first morning light wouldn't be visible in the treetops for another 30 to 45 minutes. Another hour passed that until sunrise. I was on mile five. I'm in a low bottom that's wedged between two steep ridges. The trail I'm on was narrow, muddy, and completely hemmed in by thick underbrush, young maple, and old oak growth. I'm focused on the small light from my headlamp, just one step after the other, zoned out. Then I heard a loud crack, and I froze solid. This is the part I have trouble describing. 4.30 in the springtime means I'm the only thing making noise. No birds chirping, nothing dead quiet. Mid-step, I froze. When fight or flight kicks in, you have these immediate instinct thoughts. The thought that instantly flashed in my mind as I stood there, balancing myself into silence was, if I hear that again, I'm turning around and going back the way I came in a hurry. Why? Because that sound was not a branch breaking. It wasn't deadfall. It wasn't a widow maker. I was sure that I had just heard something intentional. Hearing it twice? Well, that meant to get out of there. To describe it as best I can, it sounded like a decent-sized wooden stick being violently whacked against a small tree. More a fungo bat-sized stick than a baseball bat. The distinction in my head being that this sound was a crack, not a thud or a thump. I've described it in the past as explosive because it was so terribly loud and sudden. I had the sense that it was about 50 yards directly in front of me, and it was loud and clear. Now as I stood there, completely spooked, I realized the soon-to-be worst part of my situation. I knew where the sound had come from, and I knew where the trail went. In about 30 yards, I was going to come across a 180-degree turn and start up the ridge going away from the creek. This meant that as soon as I got the courage to move toward the noise, I was going to have to turn my back to it and get up that ridge. This made me very nervous. My head is somewhere between there's a murderer and there's Bigfoot, and I really didn't know which. Minutes pass. I just breathe the foggy breath and listen. Nothing. Dead quiet. I've got about 20 to 30 minutes until first light, so I crank up the headlamp and start to slowly creep toward that turn. When you wear a headlamp in the woods at night, every tree branch in front of you casts a big black moving shadow on the trail. That didn't help. I get to the turn and quickly make the bend. I'm moving pretty fast at this point, trying to be quiet, taking tiny shallow breaths so I can listen, and then I smell it. A stench hits me that I can't describe. I just imagined wet, rotten death. I've actually worked scenes where humans have expired in a past life as a firefighter. This was like days old decomposition, but it just smelled strange. I kept walking, fast. 
By the time I made the top of the ridge, I was huffing and puffing, and the first light was showing. I didn't stop moving until full light was out, and the birds were chirping. I have heard it all in the woods. I've smelled it all. I'm telling you, I don't know what that was. Deadfall, and especially leafed out branches, make a lot of noise on the way down. I've heard that many times. This wasn't that. But what it was, I don't know. I've lived in rural Massachusetts for 17 years of my life, and I've encountered a lot of wildlife in my time here. One day I was moving my mare up toward another pasture, which was a little ways down from my house, a good 15 minute walk. I tacked her up and we were making our way down the main road. The road is still very rural, dense forest lies on either side, and cars rarely drive on it. It's a perfect main road to horseback ride on. All of a sudden, my mare wouldn't keep going. Annoyed, I dismounted and decided to lead her on foot to the pasture. We were making our way around a corner when I noticed my mare's gaze fixated on something. Less than 15 feet away from us was a large black bear. As we made eye contact, my heart sank into my stomach. I was 16 years old at the time and barely weighed 100 pounds. Staring down something so large is unforgettable, and it was one of the scariest things I've ever experienced. Not only do I have this thing's attention, but I have a whole damn horse with me, and I'm on the ground, not even on the horse. Maybe I didn't act the way I was supposed to, but I'm alive, so I'm not complaining. I slowly started walking backwards with my mare, not wanting to risk anything. Adrenaline does weird things. After I re-rounded the corner and the bear was out of sight, I mounted my mare and made my way back to my house. I actually drove up with my car and managed to get a few blurry pictures of it, but nothing to write home about. I have had a lot of weird-ass borderline paranormal encounters in the woods, but nothing beats Mother Nature's creatures. My family used to go camping with a few group of friends when I was a kid. I remember one Christmas, when I was about five, we were camping out in the bush. There were nine kids in total at our campsite. We were allowed to wander through the bush if we wanted to. The parents would give us a walkie-talkie to tell us when to come back to camp, and we never wandered far. Anyway, out of nowhere, an unfamiliar voice came over the walkies. It was a man's voice. He said he was Santa, and that he was trying to find us to give us our presents, and asked us to look for him. We all ran back to our campsite, excited to tell everybody that we had talked to Santa. The walkie-talkie was taken off of us, and we weren't allowed to go anywhere for the rest of the trip. At the time, as kids, we were pretty devastated. But now, as an adult, I understand the seriousness and the creepiness of it, and I'm really glad that we didn't go looking for him. My story is nothing special, but I feel like I should write it down and tell it. It was during the summer of 2017 when my family had gone on vacation to California. We were at the end of our trip, in which we'd been driving from San Francisco to Los Angeles to catch our plane back home. We had just finished seeing John Steinbeck's family home in Salinas earlier, and we were heading back to Los Angeles. I remember us passing the Golden Valleys where several wineries dotted the landscape. The sun was beginning to descend, as it was some time in the mid-afternoon, possibly around four or five. We were all packed into a rental van, 
with most of my family members being asleep save for my dad, who was driving, my grandmother, who sat in the front with him, and myself, who was sitting in the right side of the back. As we were coming around a bend in the road, our backs to the wineries, I suddenly heard my dad say, what is that? Being in the back, I could only peek at his side of the van, but I definitely could make out a dark figure crossing from the left side of the road. Reasoning that I would see it in just a few seconds, I quickly darted to my side, where surely I would see whatever or whoever it was come into view. As we got closer, I saw the figure suddenly change posture from upright to walking on all fours before disappearing behind the hill we were coming around. I attempted to see if I could see it behind the hill, but to my surprise, there was nothing there. There was nowhere for it to hide, considering it was man-sized, so I was dumbfounded. My dad and I were both confused. As he was paying attention to the road, he had only seen it upright. My grandmother was more than likely zoned out, as despite being in the front, she failed to see anything. Both my dad and I believe in the paranormal, and while he believed it was a Sasquatch, I believe it could have been a skinwalker or something similar. So far, it's the only instance of the paranormal I've come across in my life, but I still think about what that might have been to this day. I just got home from a road trip, and I've been thinking about something I saw and can't make sense of. Maybe some of you have also seen something like this. My wife and I were driving on Highway 97 South, near Mount Shasta, California. It was about midnight, and we were driving through a heavily wooded area without any street lamps. We rounded a corner when I saw something fast and low to the ground dart across the street, about 50 to 60 yards ahead of us. I saw the glowing animal eyes, and a body that was the size and shape of a big dog. We saw animals the whole road trip, and, like usual, I asked my wife if she had seen it too, and she confirmed. The body wasn't 100% clear, because of our headlights, they hadn't reached that section of the road yet, when we got to the exact point in the road where the animal had crossed, we looked to that side to see if there was anything there. All there was, was a man dressed in army fatigues walking down the road. He didn't look at us, he just kept walking. It was pitch black and he didn't have any type of light with him. He was only illuminated by our headlights. We both got full body chills when we saw him because we were expecting to see an animal. I know that area has a magical and mystical history with a lot of unexplained sightings, but this is unlike anything I've ever experienced before. We were fully creeped out. I still can't make heads or tails of this, so I figured I'd tell you the story. Does anyone else have a story like this that happened to them? This happened a few months ago, and I've kept it to myself until recently when I told my dad about it. I was with my brother, who we'll call John, and one of our old friends. We were walking back through a forest back to where we'd come from. Since I'm younger than both of them, they tend to annoy me a lot, but this time they were being really annoying, so I decided to walk ahead. I was about halfway between them and the exit to the forest when I heard things snapping on my left. I just brushed it off and kept walking, but then I started to hear a low mumbling noise, so I stopped and looked around. I asked if anyone was there, 
and I got no reply until about 30 to 40 seconds later. I heard what sounded like my brother saying, come here, I need your help. So I asked what was wrong while keeping my distance because something about his voice sounded wrong. It was distorted. So I waited a few seconds and then he said again, come here, I need your help. But in the exact same way as before. So I moved to the side and that's when I see it. It was a deer, but it was on its back legs and its body was rigid and twisted. The worst part was that its eyes were exactly the same as mine, like a human's. I didn't believe that it was a bad creature. It actually seemed quite friendly, but nonetheless, I was scared. So I ran a mile back and the whole time I could feel it behind me. When I got out of the forest, I fell to my knees and looked back to see it disappear behind some trees. But here's the weird thing. Ever since then, I've been having bad dreams. Not about being chased by it or anything. In the dreams, I am it. So I told my dad about this and he didn't look surprised or confused at all. He told me of a similar event he had when he was young. To this day, I remember how it felt. That was the first time that I saw it, but I doubt it will be the last. I guess this story is a little boring, but it just happened to me, so here you go. I was rock climbing with two other guys in Colorado and was belaying one of them when the two of us on the ground heard something weird. The commands we use to communicate that we are safe at the top of a route are, name of the guy on the ground, off belay, which prompts the belayer to unclip the rope from his belay device so the climber can pull slack out of the rope. The response to that command is, name of the guy at the top of the route, belay off. The climber was approximately 40 meters up on an about 50 meter route. I didn't know this at the time. The rope stopped moving, which isn't uncommon when someone is having a hard time with a move or is setting up an anchor, which is what we thought was going on. But then we heard it. A voice that sounded way closer to the ground like close enough that we could have had a shouting conversation and way farther left off route of where the climber should have been, said, my name, off belay. I looked at the other guy in our climbing party who was just as confused as I was. He said to me, what the F was that? And we discussed where the climber should be at this time and that we shouldn't be able to hear him that well. The rope still wasn't moving but I decided to keep him on belay. I figured it would be best to keep him safe and just feed slack through my belay device in the event that it wasn't him. Turns out it wasn't. A few moments later, the rope starts moving again, later followed by a faint syllable counted, my name off belay, that sounded way more like it should have. We didn't really think anything of it, but we had been traveling down the wall and hit a few routes without seeing anyone. We also had a friend just a few months ago that got burned in on a route when someone took him off belay when he wasn't safe. I remember seeing a video of a hiker or rancher or something walking down the road when he hears the voice of a woman calling him off the road. The guy stops to figure out what's going on, then just gets out of there because of how weird it was. I'm starting to wonder if there's a cryptid that can mimic the voice of a certain person. We're not entirely sure what happened, but we know two things. Number one, it's a really good idea that I didn't listen to that first voice. And second, it wasn't a person.
My grandmother on my mother's side has always been very superstitious, for lack of a better word. She's not necessarily religious, but she does believe in a lot of paranormal stuff. Her mother was full-blooded Navajo, and her father was Irish. Either way, she'd never been anywhere east of Montana, and she grew up in Nevada. One year, when I was in grade school, we went to visit her. Most of the visit was pretty uneventful, typical boring old people stuff. Except she always kept her curtains drawn shut and would always peek out the window. And whenever somebody would ask her what she was doing, she would simply reply, Yenoglushi is watching me. This went on for nearly the entire visit until a few days before we were due to leave. My grandma and my then baby brother, he's 19 now, were in the front yard that evening planting flowers, when all of a sudden my grandmother starts shouting, get away from that creature, it's not safe, to my brother. Of course, being in Nevada, we all assumed that my brother had found a scorpion or a rattlesnake, so we all run outside to see my grandmother clutching my little brother and shaking in terror against the side of the house. Standing out in the yard was a large, black, Great Dane-sized dog. It was staring at my grandmother with an intensity that I have never seen before. It looked up at us, gave a little huff, and bounded off. I don't remember if it moved unusually fast or not, but I do remember that it had very deep yellow eyes. When my mother asked my grandmother what had happened, she kept repeating, the Yenoglushi has found me. She moved a couple of weeks after that. I think I had an experience with a skinwalker or its kin. I wonder how far their territory ranges. I lived in Phoenix for a couple of years at the turn of the century. I had two friends who grew up in Globe, a guy and a girl. She wanted to do a spell to make it rain. We went to a place on the Salt River. I don't know what it was called, but it had a parking lot, a pavilion, a bathroom and the river had concrete steps in it, like man-made rapids. The pavilion had a concrete dais in the middle of it, inlaid with a mosaic of a compass rose. We got there at about 9 p.m. or so, well after dark, only two cars in the parking lot, and they were dusty, no other people. While we were doing our spell, which was minimal, all three of us standing quietly, concentrating around a candle and incense, I heard a noise. It was men and women laughing in unison, then two voices speaking very quickly, but I couldn't understand the words, and then a canine howl. My hair stood on end. We all jerked our heads toward the parking lot and stood stock still for a minute but we didn't see anything or hear anything else. So we went back to concentrating. I didn't think the voices were weird in the moment. I figured the people that owned the cars had come back. I did think the howl was odd coupled with the voices, but I was thinking, cool, I got to hear a coyote. So after we finished the spell, we started wondering where the people were. And as we started talking, we realized that of the three of us, the girl had heard the speaking voices, the guy had heard the laughing, but I was the only one who had heard both or the howl. When I told them what I'd heard, they both got really pale. Their whole demeanor changed to alarm and they said, we have to get out of here right now. I said, okay, but I have to pee first. They were very upset by this but the bathroom was right by us. I went, but they were banging on the door in total panic after I'd been in there 30 seconds. I thought they were being overly dramatic. So we made it to the car and they're acting like we're in a horror movie. We left without further incident. After we got on the road, I asked them why they were so upset. 
They said that there were things that lived out there that I didn't want to know about. Apparently, people who live in Globe have to deal with this kind of thing a lot, based on more stories the guy told me about living there. He never mentioned the word skinwalker, though. I read about them later and finally understood why they were so scared that night. It was winter of 2017, around December. I was camping with friends right outside of a Native American reservation near St. George, Utah. None of us are native, but we were trying very hard to be respectful of the land. We set up an A-frame and every night we packed in like sardines. I was on the outside and my buddy Seth was next to me. Coyotes are pretty common in this area of the country but they're pack animals who don't really engage with campers, so it's very common to hear them, but not as common to see them up close. However, every night that week, we saw this mangled old coyote, gray hair, blistering skin, probably on the edge of death. It walked with a limp in its front left paw, kind of like a dog that gets a pebble stuck in their paw. Anyway, we went to bed one night, and I was still on edge. Around 3.15, I woke up with a sharp pain in my ear. It ended up being a beetle burrowing in my ear, but that's not important. Anyway, I hit the side of my head, and I pressed my ear, and I was freaking out because it was this really acute pain that I had never felt before. I thought I was having an aneurysm or something. Anyway. I woke Seth up to have him shine a light in my ear. As soon as he woke up, he freaked out. Like, he was horrified. I was like, what is it? He reached above his head and gets a mirror, and he holds it up to me so that I could see behind myself. To my horror, there's a scraggly old man with gray hair, a huge tumor on the side of his face, torn up clothes, walking with a cane and a limp. He doesn't seem to be at all cognizant of us. It was almost as though he was in a different dimension. He didn't have a gun or anything, so we just clutched our knives and kept our eyes on him for the rest of the night. At one point, he just wandered away. The next morning, the two other people with us said that they both had a dream that this kid, Chris, who wasn't with us, was tied to a tree upside down and a massive silver glowing elk slowly but surely gutted him alive with its horns. They said the four of us and a few other friends all sat nude around the tree, not drumming or chanting, but almost like we were sacrificing him. They both had exactly the same dream and were able to independently draw the same picture down to the order that we were all sitting in to the number of branches on the tree without consulting each other. We texted Chris when we left, and he said he'd been up all night, throwing up, completely inexplicably. I don't know if we saw a skinwalker or what, but that was the weirdest experience of my life. My hometown is small and remote, and we had a Native American reservation a few minutes outside of town. I was close to a lot of the people that lived there, mostly the teenagers and children, as they shared extracurricular activities through the school, so I grew pretty accustomed to their beliefs. Now, I moved pretty far away right before I started high school, but I visited somewhat frequently, as I still had family there. My grandmother owned a camp on a small lake. It was very quaint and nice to spend time there. However, as soon as it became dark out, things felt very different. On one side, we had neighbors for miles. On the other, it was dense woods. My cousins and I 
one a year older and one a year younger, had always found those woods creepy. We visited now and then, but always became very uncomfortable and soon left. One night, I was traveling back home, down south with my cousins and my aunt. These were very remote lake roads, inhabited by very, very few. Dense woods bordered both sides, so, naturally, some nocturnal animals were out. But one that we saw was very different. It wasn't as big as I typically see these creatures described, but it wasn't small either. Maybe the size of a large coyote, or a small wolf. And we don't live in wolf country, by the way. But it didn't look like either of those. It was crouched back on its hind legs, just kind of chilling out. As we drove past, it turned its head to look at us. It had a pretty blank face, almost like an owl's, but without the beak, and a bear's muzzle instead. Its body looked like a poor rendition of a human, like if you asked someone to draw a person but they had never seen one before. Its legs bent the wrong way, like a horse almost. It had toes like an alpaca. Its arms were very long, and frankly, it was the most human thing about it. It had very patchy, wiry, matted fur. Now, I know it wasn't an animal with mange. I've seen many animals with mange. And yes, it's scary, but it was nothing like this thing. It didn't necessarily chase us, but it trotted behind us for a while. Everybody was freaking out, naturally. But I think deep down, I knew. Can I get any confirmation or information about what this might have been? And if so, are there any precautions I should take to keep this thing away? It happened years ago, but I'm still lost. When I was younger, around 18, I was visiting my aunt in Albuquerque. She lived at a little B&B &B that had a big field behind it at the time. The second night I was there, I couldn't sleep. Around midnight, this bizarre howl or scream or cry started up. It was really loud, even inside the house. Her cats seemed to be alerted as well. So I woke my aunt up. She said that she had never heard that in 10 years of living there. Bear in mind, she's an insomniac, so she's often up very late. When the sound kept going, she started toward the door to go see what it was. But I was like, I don't think so. So we stayed in. The sound continued until around sunrise. The owner of the B&B &B was out of town at the time, but when asked, she said that she had never heard a sound like that either. We asked some of her friends who said that they had heard that somebody was going around playing sounds on a loop, trying to lure people out of the house. That's really the only lead I have. I went out into the field the next day and I didn't see anything weird. Maybe it was just someone messing with people, trying to lure them out for some nefarious reason. Or maybe it was a cryptid. Either way, it was pretty creepy.